again, and welcome to this week's edition of SCLC TV. I'm Maynard Eaton, and of course, our president and our CEO, Dr. Charles Steele Jr. Hello, Dr. Steele, how are you? Doing great, doing great, Maynard. This week, as you well know, Georgia finally passed a hate crime bill. How significant is that to the, to the country and to the folks you represent? Very significant and unbelievable that Georgia happened to be one of the four states without a, a hate crime bill. And uh, I'm just amazed and elated over the fact that a few hours ago, uh, it became a thing of the past where people can't say that once you leave Atlanta, you're in Georgia. Georgia, I don't think, understood the significance or importance of them passing this bill until a crisis came. Had to be a tragedy in terms of Ahmad Arbery. That particular loss of life brought about the attention and it wasn't easy. I like to quote what my good friend, State Representative Calvin Smyre said. Calvin said, nothing goes on under this dome at state capital without outside or external interference and commitment. What he was saying is that elected officials are well in what they do. Some are good, some are not so good. But let's talk about and applaud the ones who supported this bill after they negotiated for many of ours. But what Calvin was saying is no other than what Frederick Douglass said in terms of power concede to nothing unless there's a demand. Never has and never will. This is a pure example. And we talk about it all the time that if you don't have the influence and the, the protest campaign going outside of elected officials and outside of the legislation of passing laws, public policy will be nothing. The people so you're who saying won't. those protests on the Capitol steps made them do something. Is that correct? Absolutely. And we were a part of that. I was invited to come to the Capitol to make a stand as well. Uh, in terms of this particular bill, but we did send letters and we, we were on the state capitol protesting and talking about the hate crime bill. But the fact being is that, man, we talked about, we wanted Dr. King's statue on, on the uh, uh, capitol grounds and everyone backed up on it. Still, that'll never happen. If CLC can't get no statue of Dr. King, this is, another example and a piggyback run to get what we needed in terms of justice and equality in terms of all people. The imagery of Dr. King we were talking about before, you're talking about taking down any monuments to this degree. We were the first to go down to New Orleans a few years ago and said those monuments should come down. What am I saying? The institutionalizing of the civil rights movement in an institution like SCLC for many of years since uh, 1957 is redundancy in its own right. This is a positive effort and repetition is the mother of skill. You have to continue to repeat and repeat and repeat and march and march and march and talk loud and talk loud and talk loud. The end result is state representative Kevin Smyre said last night, and I appreciate him saying it. We get nothing done in legislation as elected officials under this dome without external pressure. Dr. Steele, as you well know, you heard the criticism. There's some young activists, some Black Lives Matters folk who say, well, SCLC, NAACP and others, hey, old, old guy, sit on the sidelines now. It's our turn. Uh, we don't really need you. I know you heard it. Does that hurt you? I heard it, but I'm also encouraged. You know, I, as you know, uh, Maynard, I spoke on the Capitol grounds last Friday. And basically uh, with the march being led by Reverend Malone and the Southeast connection with our SCLC chapter and his justice initiative coming out of 
South Georgia. And I commend Reverend Malone for what he did. And also Attorney uh, uh, Gerald Briggs. And we've been working together, what, man, three, three weeks now. And right. we were there when I spoke on the grounds and on the steps of the Capitol, Georgia State Capitol last Friday. I was one of the keynote speakers. And when I spoke, and I was receiving what I said by so many young folks. And you're talking about hundreds of young folks. And the point being is that I reminded them that I've been in this type of environment movement for 45 years, been married for, for 42 years, not to, not count my teenage years. And I'm still here and I ain't going nowhere. And they began to applaud. But I also quoted Victor Hugo who's uh, 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 in his own right uh, in terms of his legacy, Victor Hugo, in his legacy as a poet and a, a, a person of literature writings. He said, and I quote, that there's more misery among the poor than there is humanity among the rich. And those young folks just love that quote. And cliches and expressions have impact. And that's what keep me going, to hear the, the, the cliches and the, the phrases and the impactful information. It's all, it's all about charisma and, and, and wording of things that was, words that would stimulate and move people in the right way. And many so times, go ahead, go ahead. You're saying SCLC can work side by side or with Black Lives Matters and other young protesters? They can work Absolutely. hand in hand? Absolutely. Black Lives Matter is a beautiful concept, but Black Lives Matter encompasses many of things, which means that we all must coalesce together. That's basically yeah. what it's all about. So we, we, we coalesce, and that's what we always been about. At uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And I give credit to Black Lives Matter. Uh, they have contacted us many a times in terms of their various uh, geographical locations and wanted to be trained in the Kenyan philosophy. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's beautiful uh, to want to be trained through this type of uh, institutionalizing of civil rights movement coming all the way back, going 360, full circle to the founding of our co-founder, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And they want to be trained in the Kenyan philosophy. Of nonviolence. Always nonviolence. Now what all organizations must understand, which SCLC understands, I think more than anyone, there will be people that will infiltrate the movement of your organization. Civil rights movement cannot be possessed by any particular organization. The historicity of long standing and ongoing accomplishments and track record will be looked upon. Who has the track record? Thank you for asking. In AACP, in terms of the judicial aspect and approaches, in terms of Thurgood Marshalls and other, in particular, oh, I love it, uh, 1954 Brown versus Board of Education. But SCLC was always known for direct action. And the NAACP was known for dealing with the legislative aspect of the judicial system. And that's a marriage. And you can't separate either one from the other. They are inseparable. But Dr. King spent uh, many lonely nights and days not knowing who was going to be there for him in the supreme sacrifice. He used to tell many of the people that associated with him you know, one day they're going to try to get me. And if you're not careful, you get in my way and try to get a photo op. They might just get you when they're trying to get me. So what am I saying by that statement? It's bigger than getting a photo op. It's bigger than getting on the front line and getting on the camera. Dr. King knew that one day, because he was called by God, that it was going to be very difficult for him to escape doing his work without the system ultimately looking at him as the enemy. 
Ken Burns, a noted documentary producer, said recently, this period we're going through now, this protest era, all we see unfolding in the streets and, and throughout America and throughout the world, he said, this is a reckoning of our racial past because far too long, Blacks have had a knee on their neck. This is a special time, you think, do you not? He's a, a great writer in his own right. I, I've heard him when he said that man, uh, a few hours ago. Uh, what he was saying is that we always had a, 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 a situation where the police and law enforcement has always pinned us down physically, but he's also and castrated us but he as males. But he also was saying male or female, black, brown, green, or white, or poor. This system has always been against those who are less fortunate than others. And particularly if you're poor, poor whites, and particularly with the pigmentation of our skin, black, brown, red, green, or yellow, we all must work together. We knew from the beginning that this country was going to try and polarize us to the degree where even though poor whites thought they were better than us as black and brown people. And the system did that, even with the light-skinned Negro in slavery. And, you know, the type of slavery uh, we had, Chattel slavery, we were nothing more than property. And many of our young folks need to go back and read the history of who we were and where we came out of. And we never gotten reparation for what we went through. We still have to be paid. President Abraham Lincoln was conspired upon to be assassinated. And Andrew Johnson, the vice president, hands are not clean as well. And it was all about 40 acres and a mule. They didn't want Negroes at that time, color folks, to possess nothing of value. They didn't even value us as a human being. We were subhuman in terms of, 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 of this experience that we had that so-called uh, uh, the Americas within this country and throughout the Caribbean and throughout the rest of the world. Because if America disrespected us, then the rest of the world looked down upon us as well, as well as saying African-Americans has to be something special about you, what you endure. The worst slavery of on record to any degree. The Jews had that their Holocaust, but we had a Holocaust. And we must realize that it still continues. What also is still continuing is this pandemic, an uptick in COVID-19, affecting poor and black folks even more so. Now though, uh, sports is about to come back. Your concerns about where we are with re regard to this disease, uh, this flu that uh, the president calls by a racist name. Well, first of all, I, I have to commend some of the athletes, uh, particularly NBA, uh, when they say it, it ain't about no championship, it ain't about playing no uh, basketball game to get a, a championship or to be rated as a great athlete. I've heard them say that from Major League uh, to NBA and to NFL. I have to commend them because many times we, including myself as civil rights leaders and, and, and representatives of the truism of us being uh, left out and not included in the process as the citizenry impactfulness uh, being left out in this particular time and throughout many of years, uh, even with the gut in uh, 2013 of, of the 1965 Voter Rights Act, I was very critical and thought we should have more input from celebrities and athletes. But they have come to the table and said that we are against playing any type of ball with the understanding that our people are suffering and we have the inequities that we have in today's society in terms of us being left out of the process of justice well, and equality. Well, baseball's coming back. Well, 
Well, it's going to come back, but there are some Major League Baseball players who might not even show up as well. And there have been concerns about what is going to happen. Well, many of them have said, we have to take care of the issue at hand as a priority first, and that's racism. And that's also lack of our people being in, involved economically in this system. We need some owners of, of basketball and football uh, franchise. We don't have the front office being represented by African-Americans because of racism, which is a virus and a conspiracy to keep us out of the ownership. And athletes are talking about that. So let's let's applaud them to that degree. And let's not, they'll be in signal out as well as as the virus or racism impact upon them and their families. But Dr. Steele, are you surprised that NASCAR is taking down the Confederate flag? Aren't you surprised? I, I am surprised, but I'm more encouraged by Bubba Wallace in terms of his stand. And it's no different than uh, the NFL in terms of uh, Colin Kaepernick do, doing his, his kneeling with uh, his one knee. It was not about the flag from the beginning. People were misrepresenting the truth. It, it was about the uh, police brutality and focus upon uh, the profiling of, of African-Americans male. But I'm so encouraged by this young man. And it took a lot for him to do that. And, and basically, I have a relationship that I've been trying to work with NASCAR through SCLC to get them to work with people like uh, uh, in his own right uh, Bubba Wallace in terms of giving us the training program, but we got nothing but lip service. And he's the only one at that level that's really has proven himself. And one of the main reasons outside of it, the historicity of being racist is that, man, it takes a lot of money to go in NASCAR and to get sponsors. You're talking many, many, many dollars. But hats off to that young man, hats off to the temperament of NASCAR because I never thought that they would follow his lead in terms of eradicating and approaching the aspect of racism that is not only uh, plaguing uh, the NASCAR industry in the car racing business, but also this country in, in other occupations and just on our daily lives and protection of our families from the ill spirit of, 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 of this COVID of, of, of 400, I call, of 401 of us being founded upon and forced to come to this country. And this country was founded upon white supremacy. And it overlapped into all aspects of society. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to STLC TV and our president, CEO, Dr. Charles Steele Jr. See you next week.